Henry. And uh, thank you all for showing up this morning. I'm, I'm uh, happy to be here, and I uh, hope to talk about a little bit about what reservoir characterization. Okay. So first of all, I want to talk about what reservoir characterization is. And, and this is very much the same uh, definition that was put up yesterday. It's the process of determining the quantitative distribution of petrophysical properties and fluid saturations within an oil or gas reservoir. So we're really trying to look at the distribution of things. Now, you can go through a lot of permutations and combinations of this, but the, but the basic thing is we want to have a, a, a map of the, of, the, of the distribution of the oil and gas and water and the porosity and the permeability through the reservoir. And that includes things like faults and uh, different bodies of rock that are in there because those are expressed in this map of, of uh, petrophysics and, and, uh, and fluid saturations. The, uh, it's the process of doing this, of creating that uh, uh, productive, understanding of productive capabilities of, of oil and gas reservoirs. It includes determining the fluid properties, the rock properties, and other features that may influence recovery so that there are a whole series of things that may be necessary to incorporate. You wonder why do you go to all this trouble? Well, first of all, hydrocarbon reservoirs are economic resources. They're things that we invest in. And because of that, we want to make the best possible investments. We don't want to just throw our money into the slot machine and hope that, it, hope that the three bananas come up together or something. Hydrocarbon reservoirs, they should be produced in the optimum manner, not just for economic reasons, but basically for moral reasons. And hydrocarbon reservoirs, uh, the characterization, offers guidance in planning for water flooding and other operational activities. If you want to make a decision on things, you, you want to have an idea of what's going to happen as a result of that. And, and finally, the, 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 there are many interests in these things. There are interests in terms of different uh, operating interests and different royalty interests, different uh, lease holdings and so forth. And it's necessary under some circumstances to allocate parts of the production and parts of the costs among those different interests. And by understanding how the reservoir is structured, then we can, we can uh, proceed to do that. Now, I want to make two, I want to make four points. Now, I'm not going to make these real obvious, but these are basically the, sort of the themes around this talk is, is uh, structured. So, so take these down and then note as they come along when I talk about them. First of all, collect all the data that you possibly, or that you reasonably can. Reservoir characterization depends upon data. It depends upon data that may be acquired even before wells are drilled in the form of geophysical data. It acquire, inc includes data that is uh, c um, captured during the process of drilling and completion. Drill stem tests, um, pressure measurements, um, logs, um, swabbing tests, uh, various other kinds of operations that are done to determine what the production of the field is. And then things that are accumulated during the production process, the rates of production and so forth. So good character, because good reservoir characterization depends upon good data. And that leads to optimum design and operation of water floods, even when you use traditional methods of reservoir characterization. I'm going to differentiate between traditional and, and uh, more uh, esoteric ways that we could use in the future here. And Modern methods allow data re routinely collect, collect, collected during exploration and drilling and completion and operations to be examined in very sophisticated ways, and that may permit uh, operational improvement. So we want to get all the data we can because the reservoir characterization process depends upon that data, and that leads to better design and operation of water floods. And we can go ahead and we can really tear this stuff apart and analyze it in ways. Now, I'm not recommending that people who have five wells, Lan five well Lansing, Kansas City fields somewhere up in Graham County go through an elaborate process for characterization. But nevertheless, the idea that you can do this is an important thing to keep in mind. Water flooding is widespread in Kansas. In fact, the expertise on water flooding is, is uh, widespread in Kansas. This is the cover of the book by Paul Wilhite. The, the SE, uh, SPE book on, on water flooding by Paul Wilhite. And some particular intervals, especially the Lansing, Kansas City, inter City interval, the Cherokee group and the Morrow are uh, particularly good for water flooding here. Some of the other groups are not so good. 
some companies specialize in water flooding. That is to say that they either, as they develop their own properties or as they acquire properties that other operators have developed, they will water flood those things by preference and, and have been very successful at doing that. And despite the fact that there are many high-powered engineers here in Kansas, uh, many water floods are designed and according to rules of thumb and traditional methods. That is to say, people sit around a table and they have all the maps that they can find and they sit there and say, well, I think we ought to put a well here and the other person says, well, I think we ought to put the injectors over here and they argue for a while and then they decide what to do. And, and in fact, this has been codified sort of by a publication by the same guy, uh, uh, Randy Codell, but also Paul Wilhite here. This is from the TORP uh, presentations back in 1989, the TORP uh, um, water flooding, or, um, IOR conference in 1989, rules of thumb water flooding in central Kansas from the um, Kansas uh, uh, tertiary oil recovery project. Okay, so why do we do water flooding? Um, what, is, what is water flooding? Why do we do water flooding? How common is water flooding here? So that's the introduction to this. As I go forward here, I want to talk about uh, some of the things that we have to gather in order to do that water flooding. One of those things is information on the initial condition and the volume of the reservoir. There are different styles of characterization. There are different ways to approach this thing. And then I want to give an example of a Chesterian Valley fill uh, from the Pleasant Prairie field, um, which is a done, a subject of a master's thesis that was recently completed at, at KU, and some conclusions. And throughout this thing, I want to make clear that there really are different components to reservoir characterization. There's engineering components that are important in terms of recording the production, recording the uh, conditions, the pressure, the, the well histories, um, the well designs, and so forth. There are petrophysical things that, that involve uh, log analysis, um, uh, saturations, um, all those kinds of things. And then there's geology and geophysics, which as a geologist, that's the part I always think about, but it's, not, it's necessary to recognize those other con uh, concerns as well. Let's talk a little bit about the initial condition and volume. There are several different ways in which we can establish the initial conditions for the reservoir, the original oil in place, basically. The first of those is volumetric. That is to say we can measure the area of the reservoir and the thickness of the producing unit and the uh, porosity of the producing unit and the fluid saturation, uh, oil saturation, and then we can calculate the formation volume factor and we multiply those four together and we come up with an estimate of the amount of original oil in place. This, if you have a recovery factor for that, and you can say, well, my recovery factor is 20% on primary and another 15 on secondary or something like that, then you can estimate the reserves from this. It's independent of production history. In other words, you, you only have to have the description of the reservoir. You don't have to have any production history. And it applies to leases in entire fields. It's a little hard to do for a well, but you can do it for a lease and you can do it for an entire field if you want to. Same method, volumetric, very straightforward. Then there's a material balance calculation. Material balance, you have to account for all the fluids in and out of the reservoir. If you have, if you've uh, produced a certain volume of oil and a certain volume of water, and then you have the pressure history, you can apply the calculation to this, and you, can, and, and you have to have a formation volume factor as well. You can apply a calculation to this, and you can calculate the original oil in place. If you, again, if you have a recovery factor, you can calculate the reserve. But this uh, differs in that it doesn't depend upon knowledge of the field. It's just dependent upon knowledge of the production history. And, and it applies to entire fields because you can't draw a boundary on it. You can't do it for a lease and you can't do it for a well, but you can do it for an entire field. So it really measures something that is um, important to know and, and it requires a, 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 some um, pressure history in order to do this. The, the, fourth thing, the third thing I have down here is decline curve analysis, and decline curve analysis really doesn't tell you the original oil in place. What it does is tell you how much oil you can expect as long as conditions don't change. So you need a time series record of production, and you simply project, project that into the future, and then integrate the area under the curve from, that, from the present out to the economic limit of the field. And this kind of calculation applies to wells, individual wells, to leases or to the entire field. So you can do that on, on any, at any level but it doesn't tell you the original oil in place. So those are three methods that you can think about approaching these things, and they all depend upon different circumstances. So how do we get the quantities that we need to have? 
Well, these are, this is from one of those uh, projects that we do in our, uh, in our uh, petroleum design class at Razor Barati. Razor Barati's in the back. You'll see him later this afternoon. This is from one of the projects that we did uh, a couple of years ago. And it shows a map of a small area, small oil field in, in, uh, in Ford County. And this small oil field, um, this uh, map is drawn primarily on the basis of the, uh, the well data, and it's just contoured by Petra. And it, we just turned on Petra and said, contour this thing, and that's what it come out, came out with. Now, Petra doesn't know that you're supposed to have uniform contours or you're supposed to have some other methods applied to this. It doesn't do much interpretation. And so we could make an improved version of that map, but that improved version of that map still would not be really accurate. If we took each of you guys out there in the, in the class today were to take, uh, make a contour of that same data, we'd come up with, I don't know how many people there are, we'd come up with that many different maps, and they'd all be more or less right. None, none of them would be right, but they'd all be more or less right. Now, so that's one method of measuring the area. We might have a consensus. We might take an average of where everybody's contour maps are and use that as the average. But we can do better than that with the 3D seismic. It's the same area, same scale, same wells shown, and the 3D seismic really has imaged that surface almost perfectly. You can see there's quite a bit of detail in there. So we can get the area of the field if we know the, um, if we have that map and we know the, roughly the elevation of the oil water contact if there is one. In this case there was one. And it's between the lowest productive well and the highest non-productive well that's on the structure. Now when the operator looked at this map after we'd done this project, it was kind of nice because he looked at this little area over here in the southeast of the southeast of 18 and then drilled a well there uh, last year and it came in productive. So he got some real return out of the providing us the data for this uh, project. The next quantity that we need to know is about petrophysics. And we learned this, well, we need to know about fluid saturations. We learned this from petrophysics. Now, I put up here a, a picture of Gutz Archie and, a picture, and a, the Archie equation. And um, that notice that you have that several, ter several terms in there. Uh, porosity, phi is porosity, and we can get that from well logs, from neutron and density and sonic logs, and so pre preferably a combination of those things. And then we need to know the, the uh, resistivity, the total resistivity. We get that from an appropriate log. Of course, that's measured in the routine process. The A, M, and N, the con concepts, they come from core pet petrophysics. Everybody says N, A is one, and M and N vary. And, uh, and uh, that's true. And, and fortunately, we have in Kansas, we have a quite a bit of information about what M and N are because um, Alan Burns, who served a term with the survey, the geological survey, uh, measured those and, and then has published that information and it's available um, online. RW is the water resistivity, and that comes from laboratory measurements. Or if you get an analysis of the water, you can calculate it from that. And so you can measure the water saturation, and therefore the hydrocarbon saturation is 1 minus the water saturation, and away you go. So that's fairly straightforward. But then we can do some other things with this in order to understand the reservoir better. This is one example. This is a picket plot. And it's uh, a plot, a log-log plot of porosity versus resistivity. And, uh, and there's several uh, points plotted on there for a particular field. Um, I was, I, I, when I came in yesterday, I noticed that uh, Ryan Pfeiffer, who's one of the authors of this, uh, was uh, going to be here. But I learned later that he went on vacation or something to avoid being embarrassed by having his work shown up. But uh, this uh, plot shows the. Um, the points for different uh, samples from the reservoir, different depths from the reservoir where the porosity has been calculated with the, uh, with the Archie equation and the resistivity is shown from the direct measurements. And then on that you'll notice that there's one line, that the, the low, line on the lower left, that line is actually, um, uh, there's a series of points along that line and that corresponds to the line where, the, where if the rock is 100% water wet. And then there's another uh, line drawn up above that, another green line, which is 50% water saturation. So that uh, shows where the, where the well, where the rocks have water saturation on it. 
And then there's uh, two other lines drawn on there. There's a, uh, a horizontal line um, uh, drawn about 9%, I think, on this uh, logarithmic scale, which is a porosity cutoff, the idea being there that no rocks that have less than 9% porosity would be productive. And there's another sloping red line there, which is labeled saltwater cutoff, or water saturation cutoff. And rocks that fall below that line, below and to the left of that line, would not be productive because they have too high water saturation. And so the, what this plot, ha, plot has done has been to identify those rocks that are most likely to be productive. And generally, as you move toward the upper right from that uh, SW cutoff line, the rocks become more and more likely to be productive. Right? So we have a, 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 here was a clever way to figure out which particular intervals are going to be actually productive in the reservoir. OK. Now, we also need pressure history. Remember, for the, for the uh, uh, material balance calculation, we need pressure history. And the pressure history we can get from uh, drill stem tests uh, under ideal circumstances. This is a, a, a picture of a Horner plot, which is a plot of uh, Horner time versus pressure. And it's a, a, a standard way of, of treating a, a drill stem test in order to extract an initial pressure from the field. This, um, th these are commonly taken as wells are completed, not necessarily all the time in Kansas. And in fact, I was in Oklahoma talking to an operator down there, and they were saying, well, we can't get drill stem test teams, to, we can't get testing teams to come out and, and do the work, so we don't take, do till drill stem tests. We, we can't get the work done. Not, a few, not enough people in the industry. But the, the, uh, you can also get pressure from uh, static measurements in, in, uh, uh, of the wells as they're, as they're, uh, and up if they're shut in for long enough. The, uh, commonly, operators will shoot fluid levels. They use an echo meter to determine the fluid level in the pipe as it's, uh, as it's being produced. And, and this is just to determine whether or not the pump is running it most efficiently. They want to keep a certain amount of back pressure on the pump. That's not a good measure of the pressure in the reservoir. That's a measure of the pressure rate at the well face. If we want to get the pressure in the reservoir, we have to let it equalize, equ equilibrate for a while, shut the field in, let it equilibrate for a while, and then uh, measure the pressure in each of the wells, measure the fluid height in each of the wells, and that will be an indication of pressure. The problem with that is it costs money to do. It costs opportunity money to do. Whether or not people recover that money from increased production after they have shut, uh, reached open the wells is not, not clear to me, but uh, nevertheless, it's an it's, uh, expensive operation. However, if you do get good uh, pressure record, that you can you can actually make a, a realistic pressure history for the map, for the field. The lower diagram shows a, a, a thing that was done by Rod Ferris back in 1991, for the Penn field in Graham County, and it had a series of drill stem tests that were taken over a period of time. Now, rather than producing, uh, he shows initial pressure on the ordinate on this diagram. But the uh, abscissa is not time, it is cumulative production instead. So it kind of spreads out the data a little bit. And um, what uh, that shows is that there are two distinct slopes to that uh, line, to those lines. One early in the history of the field is a very steep slope, very rapid decline of pressure with time. And later on, there's a very gentle decline of pressure with time. And Ferries' interpretation of this was that the first part was a result of the fact that the field was initially below the bubble point, and so the pressure drop was exclusively from oil expansion drive and was a very rapid drop. The second phase, the flatter line there, is a result of the fact that the field had passed through the, pressure, uh, the bubble point pressure, and he estimated it out as about 285 PSI. And at that point, the, the field was producing by gas expansion drive rather than simply uh, uh, oil expansion drive. And so the pressure was dropping uh, more slowly. There are two points up at the top. This is the other point about this diagram. There are two points up at the top with a red circle around them, red oval around them. And those points illustrate a, uh, that there were two wells which were drilled later in the history of the field, but apparently they were not connected to the overall, to the rest of the field. So they had still had virgin pressure in them, despite the fact that they came in after there had been 200,000 barrels of oil produced. So it's a, this diagram has a lot of information in it, just from simple things about this. And from this, then you can go through the material balance calculation and figure out how much oil there was originally in the field. 
<coughs> this is another um, illustration of a field out in uh, uh, Thomas County showing the, the uh, distribution of pressure at two different times in the field history. The first one was in uh, 1990, the second one was in 1995, and it showed uh, these are from models that were made of the, of, after, of the decline of the field production and the pressure that was um, associated with that. So basically what there were were two drill stem tests available for this field, and those two drill stem tests took place over a period of time, or took place at different times, and the students had mon monitored this, uh, had um, modeled this field, and they had calculated how much production had come from which parts of the field, and from that they could calculate the pressure in those different parts, and you can see that you can demonstrate that there's a decline in pressure over these two things. They were not successful with the material balance calculations, however. Okay. The other thing we need to know is production. Well, we can measure the oil production because the oil production sold, right? The, the, the guy that comes by in the truck or the person that stands by the monitor in the, in the uh, pipeline measures the amount of production of, of oil. Fields may produce gas, as marketable gas, and if they produce marketable gas, then we have a measure of the marketable gas that's been sold. However, some fields have too little gas to market or it's inconvenient to market it and so the gas is, is flared or vented or perhaps used to run equipment on site. And that, so we've lost that information. The other piece of information we need is water production. Now many of the fields in, the, in Kansas at least are in the transition zone and consequently they produce substantial amounts of water. And the way in which this is handled normally is through uh, barrel tests where periodically the the pumper will extract some of the oil and measure the ratio of oil to water. This particular field here is producing about 1% water and about 1% oil and about 99% water. It's a hunting field down in Oklahoma. Um, the operator's quite happy with it, so so far be it from me to complain. Okay. Now the final thing that I had talked about earlier was decline curve analysis, and decline curve analysis is a process of looking at the time series history of record of production and determining um, how much oil can be produced. Here's a nice example from another oil field showing the decline curve analysis for a particular field um, where the blue dots are the, are the uh, data and the, and the black line is a curve that's been fitted to it, an ARPS, ARPS decline curve calculated by uh, some of the students, and this, this curve shows, a, it very well fits the data, and from this you can project it out into the future and you can figure out, well, how many wells you have, how much you have to have produced from each well, and therefore what the economic limit of it is, and how much oil you're going to get out of it, so it's a good way to establish the value of that, of that property. The uh, problem is that it, it, it assumes that there are no changes of conditions. So that it may be that the economic conditions change. Price of oil goes up, price of oil goes down. They will affect how, what the ec oper operating economics is. If you go in and install a water flood, or you uh, drill new wells, or you shut in wells, that will also affect the shape of this curve and will change its, its uh, future. So we see, um, here's another, that doesn't show up very well, I guess, but there's another decline curve here, and you can see that, the, that it has a cumulative decline curve on it. Let's see if I can find the pointer. There it is. It has a cumulative decline curve here, but this is the um, rate curve right here. You can see it's declining nicely through there, and then so it operated, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Operator drilled another well, somewhere in there. Well, you can see that that curve is not nice smooth one like the last one was, and that that's, those conditions indicate that they, there have been difference in the, in the in the way in which the field was produced, and that affects the shape of the curve. Okay. Now, there's other information that's necessary. We need to know something about the oil properties. We need to know the gravity, we need to know the viscosity, the solution gas oil ratio. The, the gravity comes from samples. Generally, the, during the drill stem test uh, process, the operator will, or the uh, technician will measure the, the gravity of the oil. When the oil is sold, the gravity is measured. The viscosity of the oil comes from laboratory measurements. Um, those are not commonly done, but it's relatively easy to do. 
solution gas oil ratio from production information. We need to know the bubble point. Sometimes we have to infer that, um, but uh, it may show up from production rates or from other information. There's the formation volume factor, and I don't know how they get that. Maybe somebody can tell me here. And then there's the uh, mobility ratio. This is especially important for water flooding. Mobility ratio is effectively the ease with which oil moves through the reservoir compared to the ease with which water moves through the reservoir. If the water moves more easily through the reservoir, when you water flood it, the water, fl water is likely to bypass the oil. If the r ease of moving both of those things is about the same, then the oil should be efficiently displaced by the water as it moves through. So it's, a, it's an important quantity, and it's basically the ratio of effective permeability to, and viscosity of oil and water. Okay, there's other things we need to know. We need to know about rock properties. There are things that can interfere with the water floods. Um, chlorite is a clay mineral that has iron in it, and if it is subjected to oxidizing waters, it will oxidize that iron and produce a precipitate that, is, that may block pores. Kaolinite is another clay that, and, and smectite and illite are all other clays, and they have mobility issues. That is to say that they may be able to move through the reservoir, and when they do, they move into places where they can block the pores easily, and, and by blocking the pores, then they, they can effectively reduce the flow of the water, or they can reduce the injectivity of the reservoir. Ferric carbonates are subject to oxidation. Iron, iron bearing, uh, ferrous, that should be ferrous carbonates, sorry about that. Ferrous carbonates are subject to oxidation, just like the chlorides are, and consequently they can, uh, they can cause precipitates that can block the reservoir and reduce the uh, injective uh, capabilities. Something about rock expansion properties, they're really pretty small. Permeability, permeability is really an important factor. Uh, but you notice I haven't talked about it yet, and that's because it's very difficult to determine. We can do, if we have core data, we can do a porosity permeability uh, transform, and I'm going to talk about one of those that was done by the, my student in a, in a few minutes. We can do that transform and get some good information, but that's not necessarily um, useful elsewhere in the reservoir. And uh, there are no logs that really measure permeability in any any uh, quantitative way. So that's a very difficult thing. But it turns out that permeability is less important than relative permeability. And relative permeability is even harder to determine than permeability. Um, and I put down here the means in which we can get that are laboratory measurements or uh, uh, WAG, uh, and I think you all know what WAG, that WAG stands for wild ass gas, right? So here's a, per a relative permeability curve down at the bottom of this uh, figure, and uh, the, uh, the uh, abscissa is the uh, uh, water saturation from, it's not from 0 to 100, I don't think. No, it's from uh, 0.15 to 0.7. And the uh, uh, abscissa, the, uh, uh, the ordinate rather, is the um, permeability for each of those fluids relative to their permeability in, a, in, a, in a, their absolute permeability. The two curves, the, the one that comes down from the left down to the right, lower right hand corner is the permeability to oil. The other one is the permeability to, to water. And as you can see, they, they are, the, the presence of water reduces the permeability of oil. The presence of oil reduces the permeability of water. And, and that's, uh, during a water flood, of course, you're moving across that, that uh, field from left to right, and that changes the permeability of those two things as that happens. Okay, that's that's a, some of the data that we need in order to do the water flood calculation, the water flood uh, materials. There are different styles of characterization, different ways of approaching this process. So, what are those? Some of those things. Well, there's geological uh, or interpretive char uh, characterization, and uh, Hendrada talked a lot about these yesterday. Basically, what we do is we use geological insight or geophysical insight to map, to assign um, inner well properties from values determined at the wells or from other information, geophysical information. So we have some kind of information and we use that as a basis for assigning things. And commonly, the, the, this is done, uh, at least the, kind of the ways that I've done it in the past, have been basically to recognize what we call flow units. 
Those are entities that share petrophysical properties so that it might be a particular kind of sandstone that's in the reservoir, a, a cross-bedded sandstone, for example, or a, or a uh, particular lithophases of sandstone, the, 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 the uh, point bar facies of the, of the uh, fluvial system, for example. And we would recognize that within that flow unit, um, which might be continuous or there might be several different ones in the reservoir, that there'll be a range of, of petrophysical values, that, the, that there will be a range of porosity and permeability for that particular value. And then we can actually, um, but the, the average is distinct from that of other properties, other um, entities, other flow units. And so we can actually uh, try to make an effort at saying, well, this part of the reservoir has these properties and that reservoir has those properties. They can be assigned a range of values, and we can do this um, by doing it by assigning a range of values. It's possible to go to the next step, which is to use a stochastic or statistical means of calculating the reservoir. And what this does is use measures of the characteristics of the properties, measures of the characteristics of the properties, measures of the characteristic ranges of the properties to fill the inner well area. So for example, we can measure the porosity at each, at each well. We can measure it in each type of rock in each well. And so when we do that, we can then calculate the average for each type of rock and the standard deviation for each type of rock. And then we can tell the computer to, OK, every time we think that this, this kind of rock is present in the reservoir, I want you to pick a value from that range of porosities and permeabilities and assign it in there in some random fashion within that, with that, that entity. So that's basically a, a useful way in order to fill in the gaps. The problem is if it's unconstrained, the uncertainty becomes so large that it, that it becomes meaningful. Now, the, the, extreme, the extreme other system is to use a deterministic system. John Dovton used to talk about this, deterministic systems. When we were studying a lot of Cherokee reservoirs in southeastern Kansas, he said, well, maybe what you ought to do is just go down to, to West Mineral and fire up Big Brutus and go up there and dig out the reservoir itself and, and actually look at it in, in pieces as it comes out. And, and I, I was tempted, but uh, we never did that. But the thing that's changed since those days is the availability of 3D seismic. And it was pointed out yesterday, the detail in which you can approach a reservoir in 3D seismic becomes such that it is possible to have a virtually deterministic description of the reservoir. The problem is converting from the seismic attributes that you can measure into the petrophysics. What does a particular value of some, your favorite seismic attribute, mean in terms of porosity and fluid saturation? That conversion is hard. That, that's, that's the one that's got to be normalized. But we have good pictures of the reservoirs uh, possible right now. It's just we don't know what they, quite what they mean. It's best to use combinations of this. It's best to use your geological or, or geophysical information to develop a structure of the reservoir, then assign the properties, and then try to relate those to the geophysical properties and make a real dis description of the reservoir. What I want to do next, I think it's next, is to talk about a particular example where this was done. Oh, first I want to show this diagram, because the, as a result of those, those, um, those um, uh, steps of reservoir characterization, it's possible to model the, the history of the reservoir. This shows uh, an, a map of the uh, Southeast Campo unit in Baca County, Colorado, and it shows the distribution of oil saturation. And if I can make this movie run, it'll show the distribution. I hope I can make the movie run. There's the arrow right there. And it'll show how this changes during the process of production. And the field went from being being from just on primary production and being water flooded, and you can see where that happens. Where's the, the arrow disappeared on me again. That's not what I want. I want. Jeremy, where'd you hide the arrow? Oh, oh there we go. Okay, so you can see as the production goes on, the water saturate, the oil saturation drops from red down into gold, down into yellow to green, and then all of a sudden, right there, they start to water flood. 
you can actually see how the water flood changes the saturations. Now, when you do this, you have to have a, your wits about you. You notice that the oil has accumulated over in the southwest corner of that field. And in so doing, what's happened is that the, that the, um, um, it reflects the fact that there is a no-flow boundary over there, and it would, that the oil was forced over there by the increasing pressure of the water. So it's an artifact of the, of the field. But the other thing that you notice is as that, is that thing uh, ran, ran through, is that if you st can stop it at the right point, right before the water flooding, you can figure out where the oil is, where the most of the oil is, and you can then test your pattern to see whether you have the optimum pattern for the water flood. So by using the modeling, it's possible to figure out what the optimum pattern is. And you could put the wells in exactly the right place. You say, well, put the wells in exactly the right place. Suppose that makes 10,000 barrels of oil difference in the amount to accumulate. If you're going to drill a well anyway, 10,000 barrels is not that much, but, if, but putting it in the right place as opposed to the wrong place, 10,000 barrels makes a big difference. We all know what the price of oil is. We can do that multiplication. We all do that multiplication in our head all the time. Now, there's lots and lots of examples of modeling. One of the most elegant ones that's been done here in Kansas recently is the, mark, the work that was done by the Geological Survey on the Huguenot and Gas Field um, uh, that, uh, um, where they, they tore that gas field apart and, and determined how much gas was originally placed, how much gas is uh, still there. They took it apart geologically in a very elegant fashion. If you haven't read that work, I recommend it to you. It's Marty Dubois and his colleagues. Uh, he, Marty Dubois did that for his PhD, but there was, he had a lot of help. Um, John Dubton and uh, uh, Lynn Watney and, and uh, a whole lot of, uh, Alan Burns and a whole lot of other people were heavily involved in that project. It was a very elegant project. Okay, now I want to talk about another an example of this, uh, Chesterian Valley Fill in, in uh, the uh, Pleasant Prairie Field. This shows a map of southwestern Kansas. You can see the county names there. And in that, in the, uh, the, the contours basically are on the top of the, of the uh, St. Louis. And in that, cut into that St. Louis, there's a long north-south boundary, uh, north-south channel. And along that channel, there are several oil fields. The one I want to talk about is the one all the way up at the top, the Pleasant Prairie oil field. And it's only part of the Pleasant Prairie oil field. It, uh, that's, a, that's a, I guess, a. Uh, um, a much younger field in this, but this one particular area has a long, narrow uh, valley in it that is filled with sandstone. This is an image of that, of that valley itself, that just the present prairie part of that valley, and you can see along the right-hand side of it is that very deep, narrow valley. Uh, that green arrow down in the lower right-hand corner points to the north, so that's a north-south cross-section. It's a very, very clear, sharp, uh, boundary that's been cut into that. And of course, this is vertically exaggerated 10 times, so it's, uh, it shows it up a little bit more spectacularly than it really is. Now, Peter Sr. studied this uh, for his master's thesis. He had a lot of help in that process, some of which was from me, not all of it by any means. But basically, this diagram talks about the workflow, and I've color-coded it so that, that the blue parts are the data, input data, and, and input data came in the form of core description. We had, there were two cores from the field. There's well log analysis for uh, where he had defined lithophases in the core descriptions, and then he used those lithophases to look at the, at the uh, well log uh, porosity permeability and um, uh, other properties uh, from the well logs of those things. And there was core petrophysical data available, that's porosity and permeability data, and so that was used to create a, a transform calculation from uh, log uh, porosity measurements to equivalent core per permeability measurements, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the, finally there was the structural framework, the 3D information that we got from the seismic data that were available. The green boxes talk about the, the uh, kinds of uh, data analysis that he was able to do. And those were agglomerative, hierarchical, clustering analysis. Okay. You don't have to know what that is, but basically what it is is a statistical means of recognizing which samples group with which other samples. So he was able to take the, the, the uh, properties that he could measure on the core of samples and determine which ones were distinct in terms of the properties that he was, that he was considering. 
there was a well logging porosity, well log porosity to find the best match to core porosity. I'll talk, as I said, I'll talk about that in a minute. And then there was an artificial neural network, which creates means, teach, you teach the computer how to tell different lithophases apart on the logs. So that where you have core data, you can train the computer, and then you can use that information to use the computer then to interpret the logs in a quantitative fashion, in a probabilistic fashion, to say this, um, this two-foot interval, this one-foot interval on the log is composed of this facies, whereas that one-foot interval is composed of a different facies. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. And then he used this to predict that to predict the lithophases distribution in the uncored wells as well as the cored wells. And then that meant that he had um, his lithophases quantitatively described in those different wells. And then he could take that and put that into a stochastic modeling program and determine realizations of the field that represented this, that had the same properties as the whole field, but were not the same as the whole field. Nevertheless, they had the same properties so that they would behave the same way as they, when they recovered. I'm getting a little chuckle out of the back of the audience there. You understand what I'm talking about, though, right? It's, it's just, it's, it's a, a pretend field, right? Okay. Core description, very straightforward. I'm not going to show you a bunch of pictures of lithophases, but basically standard core description to determine what kind of rock was present. And uh, some of the rocks had nice cross beds like the ones on the right, or excuse me, the ones on the left. The ones on the right, there's a, a, a the, uh, right there at 52, 18 feet, that's a calcite cemented zone, which was a, a problem with the rocks. The core, the uh, columns on the, on the right here are uh, images of the, of the cores. You notice that there are uh, sandstones and conglomerates. There's uh, St. Louis limestone at the base, and the conglomerates run up through the through the much of the thickness of the thing. Okay. Peter was able to re identify lithophases from the core analyses, and here's the lithophases he listed there, and and then he was able to uh, relate them to the log pr properties uh, using the log on the right, which is one of the cored wells, and you can see there that there's a uh, he. Uh, has conglomerate and pebbly sandstone, weakly stratified sandstone, conglomerate, laminated sandstone, some missing core, of course, weakly stratified sandstone, heterolithic uh, mudstone sandstone, and then some conglomerate, and then it cuts down into the St. Louis limestone beneath that. So he was able to, to recognize and describe those facies in the cored wells. He couldn't do it in the non cored wells because he didn't have enough uh, uh, memory capacity in his brain. I'll come back to that in a minute, but first I want to talk about converting core, uh, comparing core porosity and permeability. This first diagram shows just a plot of all of the core porosity permeability measurements. Porosity is on the, uh, on the abscissa, the ordinate is per, uh, permeability. And what you notice is it looks like somebody turned their shotgun about uh, this way and then fired both barrels. There's a lot of variation in there, and in fact, particular values of porosity, there's a range of uh, three orders of magnitude of permeability. So it's not a very precise picture. But because he divided it up into lithophases, he can be a little bit more sophisticated about it than that, and he can make this diagram, which shows sandstone versus conglomerate. The sandstone's in yellow, the conglomerate's in red. And that, there's a pretty good separation between those two. It's, no, it's better, that gives a, the, uh, R squared for the first diagram was 79, seven, uh, about 0.8. This one's about 0.82, a little bit better. Um, but the conglomerates is worse, 0 0.05, 0 0.57. So that's not significantly related. But then he noticed that there are those four yellow points, right? Four or five yellow points right at the tip of the conglomerate line. So what he did was, oh no, he divided it up first a little bit into. There were two types of conglomerates. There was one type of conglomerate that's a basal conglomerate, and then there were conglomerates up in the succe succession. The conglomerates up in the succession tended to have uh, calcite cement in them, whereas the basal one did not. And so he divided it here, where the blue line is for the non-basal conglomerates, and the red line is for the basal conglomerates. And they, they, the, the basal conglomerates are useless, 0.27 for an R squared, and the uh, 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 non-basal conglomerates are a little bit better, 0.6, but the sandstones are now about 0.85, and notice that he's taken those, those, um, 
few points that are right in here for, that are labeled sandstone, and they're now part of the conglomerate picture now. So that's what part of what makes the thing less good. He's moved them over there to that picture. Okay. Then just remember there are four different types of sandstone. There's laminated sandstone, cross-bedded sandstone, and so forth. And when he <coughs> separates those out, then he finds that those particular things have very high correlation coefficients between porosity and permeability, for, with one exception. The blue here, which is the cross-bedded sandstone, has low correlation, 0.58 for R squared. But the others are all in the 0.9 range, 0.94, 0.95 even, uh, for their, their correlation coefficients. That means there's excellent correlation between those things. But the other thing to notice is that they're stacked on top of one another so that there's really no difference between the petrophysics, the permeability at least, of the different kinds of sandstone, even though geologically we could recognize that they were different. He can demonstrate that with a cluster analysis. This is a cluster analysis. A cluster analysis determines the degree of similarity between things. And the, the, the scale here, the, the, the dissimilarity scale, <coughs> goes from 0 to 600 on there. So, the things that separate, you'll notice there's some faint lines in there. Those faint lines show where things separate, and they separate way up high for initially, and then as you come down, the dissimilarity gets less and less, and the things down at the bottom are all very similar to each other if they're adjacent to each other or if they're connected by those lines. And basically, I don't expect you to read this diagram. I've blown it up on the next picture, and this is just the lower part of the diagram, and basically all the sandstones show up on the left, and all the limestones show up on the right. All the uh, conglomerates in limestone show up on the right. And, and the sandstones are not very different. You'll notice that the, the, that the, that the, that the uh, dissimilarity index here that's shown by these horizontal lines is down at very low values, whereas the separation between sandstone and limestone, if you remember from the w previous picture, is way up at the top. For they're very dissimilar to each other. Basically, this says the And notice that the different colors, which represent the different kinds of sandstone, are all interfingered with each other, all intermixed with each other, which means that the, you can't tell the sandstones apart, basically. So that meant that when he was doing further analysis of this, he just took all those sandstones and said, this is all the same stuff. We're going to treat it as all the same stuff. So that led to this diagram. This is basically the same slide I showed earlier, but I've stuck in another column here. This is faceable, facies discernible in the cluster analysis, and Anne. Anne is, not, is the name of my wife, but that's not what this is. This is the neural, net, neural network. So the limestone was not considered. The conglomerates were divided into non-basal conglomerate and basal conglomerate and interbedded quartzite and quartzite and heterolithic mudstone sandstone. That's those five or four or five points that were together. Then there's the sandstone, which is the reservoir facies, and then there was shale, which was not actually encountered in the cores, but it nevertheless was an important uh, component of the reservoirs. To describe this, he, pr he produced an artificial neural network. Now. I'm not, going to, I'm not an expert on artificial neural networks, but I understand sort of how they work. Basically, what you do is you have a number of properties, which are shown on the left here. And, and this, is one, this is a diagram from Marty Dubois' uh, work on the, on the uh, Huguenin, where he put in a number of different properties. There for uh, MNN is the uh, marine or non-marine, and relative position means how, where it is in the column. Gamma ray is gamma ray intensity. Uh, log ILD is the uh, deep resistivity. Then there are two measures of porosity there. One is the, the, the average porosity from neutron and density. The other one is the difference between the neutron and density porosity, which helps dis distinguish between sandstone and limestone and shale. And then there's the photoelectric effect. And, and those were the inputs. The inputs, something happened in the computer. And what the computer did was calculate the probability that a particular layer of rock met a particular set of criteria. Now, you train the computer based upon core data. So you have a core data where you know what those values are. Then you can feed in these values from the log, and then the computer will calculate the probability that each of those, um, each interval in the log is of a particular facies. It might be 80% that it's marine facies and 20% that it's non-marine. There are two, the hidden layer is characterized, it says here, by the number of nodes. That is how many little, how many little circles there are. And it's characterized by the damping parameter, which tends to um, 
keep those things from acting as strongly as they might. The point here is not that you should understand artificial net, neural networks. The point is that you can use this to calculate the probability that particular intervals on logs of uncored wells represent particular lithophases. So you can make a probabilistic statement of that sort of thing. And you can show how they actually do. Here's a couple of examples here. Uh, Senior ran several different cases of this. And uh, this shows two of those cases. And the case for the lower one down here at the bottom was better at figuring out which layers were sandstone and which ones were shale than the one up at the top. You notice the one at the top, there are a lot of low gamma curves there, which are labeled gray, which is shale, whereas they should all be labeled yellow, uh, representing sandstone, as they are in the lower curve. So what this showed was that that case, as that one was set up, was more discerning about the lithology of the reservoir. So he trained this, um, this computer using the information from the cores and then did a sample, uh, did a, uh, was able to analyze the non-cored logs to produce a, a, um, a depiction of the reservoir. He then took that information and using Petrel, not Petra, but Petrel, the Schlumberger product, to make realizations of the reservoir which represent the fractions of the reservoir that are of particular lithophases and something about their extents and um, honor the well data. So it's, it's two things that are controlling it here. One is the, is the uh, lithology at the wells. The second one is the fraction of each of those lithologies that's present in the reservoir based upon the well samples. And so this particular diagram shows a, a transect through the reservoir. Now, you're saying, well, that's all cool and everything, but, but what good does it do, it do us? Well, let's think about this. First of all, this is one transect. It happens to run right through all the wells in the field, all right up and down the axis of that, that little narrow valley. And so that's one factor. There are other transects that can be done. It was a narrow field, but nevertheless, depending upon the bin size that you use in this thing, you can make several different transects, uh, both um, transverse and, and uh, longitudinal. And you can also um, have uh, Petrel make multiple realizations of this, so that it can, you can have 10 different views of the same reservoir that all share the same properties. They're not the reservoir, but they represent the reservoir very effectively. So basically, you can make a geologically reasonable prediction of the distribution of lithophases or reservoir properties of porosity, permeability, and fluid saturations. Those static models can be in, introduced into a, into a computer, into a modeling program, and then they can do numerical flow modeling and test it for history matching. Okay, so we can actually test them against the production from the history. Or you can do seismic modeling to see if they respond the same way to the seismic, to the seismic energy. So these are very, very um, uh, powerful tools for understanding what's in the reservoir. Well, you're sitting back there saying, gosh, this, do I really have to do all that stuff? The answer is no, you don't have to do all that stuff. You can do it. That's, that's the point I want to make, is that you can do this if you have the right kind of data and if you have the right kind of field that justifies it. And you can learn a lot about the field. Now, of course, you have to have drilled quite a bit, number of wells in order to get this kind of sort of information, so that it may be that you're post-dicting uh, production rather than predicting production. But nevertheless, you can, uh, with suitable information, you can go in and really tear things apart. Here's, a, here's something which, which was illustra illustrative and might have actually paid for this if it was done in the right circumstances. Senior divided the reservoir into 12 polygons, and he calculated for each of those polygons, based upon his best models, the, uh, the original oil in place for each polygon. And uh, calculated a low case and a high case. Those are the f uh, second and third columns from the left in this, in this chart. And those are in 10 to the third. Those are in 1,000 barrels of oil, of stock tank barrels of oil. Then he calculated a recovery factor um, using the cumulative production 
And that's in stock tank barrels. Now, I don't know why you use 10 to the third stock tank barrels in one and stock tank barrels in the other. It's a little confusing. But nevertheless, the, th the, th the middle column, the, the fourth one from the left, is in cumulative production from each of those polygons, from each of the wells in those polygons. And then you could calculate the recovery factor for each of those things. And the recovery factors <coughs> show a fairly broad range. This particular one here is very interesting because it produced about 150% of the original oil in place. <laughs> I, 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 I thought, well, gosh, the, the, this is a wonderful, wonderful device they have there, a perpetual motion machine. The ones down here are a little less impressive. Um, number 12 there produced one, ten, one, one hundredth of the original oil in place. And then number 11 right above it produced uh, about 6 or 7% of the original oil in place, according to his estimates. But that may mean that what we need to do is focus the efforts on those two lower polygons, number 11 and 12, because it looks like there's a lot of oil down there still. So that this process may have actually identified spots where there's sub substantial amounts of oil, even for a field that was as fully developed as this one. OK. Well, we kind of come full circle here. Careful collection of data, engineering data, petrophysical data, geological and geophysical data, allows building realizations of the reservoir. We can make images of what the reservoirs are. We can do this in a geological or an interpretive fashion, such as lithophases or seismically mapped volumes, and then test it statistically. We can test it against the history of pressure and production, determine if the realizations are realizations, not fossilizations. Fossilizations, is that a word? I think I just made that up. <laughs> But do we have to know all about the reservoir in order to characterize it? No, no, no. We don't have to go through all the steps that Peter Sr. went through. Geophysics and well control and seismology provide good pre pre uh, preliminary description. And we can test that statistically. We can test that by modeling. We can, we can see whether that actually makes a good idea, with it, a good information about it. The important thing, though, is we've got to have good data. We've got to know what the, what the, uh, what the uh, pressure was initially. We've got to know what the porosity was. We need to know good production data. We need to know how the well history is carefully recorded. If we don't have that good data, it's very, very difficult to do any kind of meaningful characterization. I want to, I want to stress data is the thing we want. So basically, reservoir characterization provides guidance for operational arrangements and information for allocating production and costs and setting up water floods. It's a guide here to us, and it helps allocate the production and cost for things. It's a data, it is data dependent. Operators should establish guidelines for data gathering during exploration, drilling, and completion, and operational phases of oil fields. Modern methods, including 3D seismic, build statistical, statistical techniques and simulation using multiple calibrated realizations of reservoirs can lead to complete understanding of the hydrocarbon reservoirs. We can do elegant things now if we have the right kind of data and we have the patience. And data is the key to the good, good reservoir characterization. So we need to collect it throughout the history of the field. That's what it, it does. There are lots of people I need to acknowledge. I teach the petroleum geology class, and I teach this uh, design class, Reza and I, and Don Green is just stepping out of that this year, I teach the, the, the petroleum engineering design class up at KU. The class, a lot of the information that I use came from their, their work. Um, faculty colleagues in geology and petroleum engineering. Uh, Murph and Richie, Bresco and Vest more or less had data uh, that was shown in those uh, slides, some of those slides. I've talked to a lot of individuals in the oil industry. I like doing it, and I certainly want to continue to do that. I appreciate the, the input that I get from them. Stan McCool and DOE funded uh, uh, Peter Sr.'s master's thesis, and then uh, Torp for allowing me to invite myself to make this presentation. I think that's what happened, wasn't it, Terry? No, no, of course not. <laughs> and then finally, questions? Questions for Tom? Just let me know if you have a question. I'll bring the mic around so everybody can hear. Thanks very much. Um, I was wondering if you could talk for a second about uh, the applicability of different statistical interpolation methods, uh, Kriegian and other methodologies, in between static data points and wells and uh, creating larger no, reservoir I can't. characterization. Uh, that's why I have the magic eight ball here. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, no, I'm, I'm really not a statistician. Uh, John Dovton. Is, is good at that. Uh, John Davis, who used to be with the Geological Survey, now is teaching at, uh, uh, lives in Baldwin, Kansas, and teaches at Baker University sometimes, and sometimes in Austria. He uh, is a, a leading expert on that su actual subject. He has a book called D Geophysics and Data Analysis in, in, in uh, uh, Geology, I think it's called, that is, that is sort of a standard work on that 
process, and, and, and they can, those folks can deal with it. They're specialists in that. We're very fortunate. We, we have excellent people in, at, here at the university um, for dealing with a whole range of, of questions in the petroleum industry, and, and I would guide you to those people. Fair enough. Thank you. What else? Let me grab you the... Vertical well. Have you right. ever start look at the some horizontal well or new new way to open open the horizontal? Form? Yeah. No, I haven't done that. Uh, we we teach primitive methods. Uh, <laughs> in some respects, I mean, it's it's just that uh, um, uh, the same methods would presumably apply the horizontal wells. It's just that they wouldn't be stratigraphically controlled, but geologic geographically controlled. So you'd be moving. I don't know. Yeah, there's been quite a bit of work on that. In fact, uh, um, uh, in, in related to uh, recovering in Canada, the steam floods up the, where there's steam floods rather than water floods, they do. There's been a lot of modeling of of the um, of the of the uh, effect of fluids running through the reservoir. I don't can't, can't provide you any references to that, but but that that's been a very important topic up there because. Even though we have the image of the oil production from Canada re involving ripping up the trees and, and digging big holes, most of the production is, is, is uh, underground from steam floods and other enhanced oil recovery methods um, that are very dependent upon, uh, for optimization, are very dependent upon how you place the laterals and so forth. Um, Tony, could you go back a few slides? Uh, it was a cross section. Um, that one? No, go down. I think it's that one. Uh, looking at that, would the green be interpreted as being productive zone and the blue as shales or non-productive? Uh, the, 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 the legend over there says that the, that the um, yellow is the sandstone. Okay. And the, the blue is the um, non-basal conglomerate, and the green is the basal conglomerate, even though it's not at the base, it's up in the, it's, it has the properties of that. And the shale is actually um, not colored, it's white. I think if we go back to the previous, previous slide here, you'll see, no, the shale over there is brown. The, sh the shale was just in the part of the reservoir. This is the same figure, the, the, just, the next slide just shows the, the left-hand end of it. Okay. Um, and you can see the shale in brown there, but the, in this figure right here, the, the productive interval is the sand, is the yellow stuff. Okay, well that's, uh, and then the vertical lines going through that are the well wells. Wells, those are wells, yeah. But, uh, but I see a, a few things there that are really interesting. If you look at the, the, uh, the green or the yellow, I'm not sure, the sand. If we look mm -hmm. at the sand, there are some discontinuities in that going across the cross section uh, for instance, if you were trying to water flood from one of these wells to the other, mm -hmm. uh, there would be some zones that are not connected well to well. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you were to place another well in between those uh, wells, you might connect up more rock and, and be able to flood then yeah, zone to zone. So there's an element, this is really interesting to me, there's an element in this analysis that demonstrates the discontinuity of the rock. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, now remember what this. Remember, this is a statistical realization of the of the reservoir. This is not what it looks like, but that's that's has the same properties as what it looks like, and and so that that any one particular little blue line in there is probably not real, except right at the well bore. But nevertheless, it it our hope is that that this thing resembles a reservoir. We can we could run this same simulation thirty times and get 30 different realizations of it. The other thing to remember is that this is a two-dimensional simulation of a three-dimensional object. So things that are connected in, in this, are not connected in this diagram might be connected out of the, out of the plane of the section. So it's, there, all that stuff is involved in the, in the situation. But nevertheless, it's, the, the, the nice thing is if we, had, if we had a nice visualization room here, we could actually uh, make this visualization in three dimensions and crawl inside it and see whether the, the things were connected in three dimensions, right? And, and then we could redo that, make another realization and do the same thing to determine how likely it is that additional wells would 
produce the recovery. So that's, that's the power of this technique is that, that it makes it, it might make a 1% difference or a 2% difference in the, in the production of the field, but 1% or 2% at today's oil prices is a huge amount of money compared to how much this costs to do. Tony, really good job. Thank you. Um, my name is Dave Morbacher. I'm director of the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute at the University of Wyoming, and I'm a TORP alumni. Um, Tony, have you and Reza and Don talked about how to incorporate uh, design of unconventional reservoirs? Have you developed a strategy? We're struggling with that question in Wyoming, how to focus our efforts. Just curious how you have decided to tackle You're that sitting issue. back there by Reza. You should ask him that question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we haven't really dealt, that, dealt with that. that, but that's an interesting question because probably the, uh, it's important, um, our philosophy in teaching this, at least my philosophy, and I think Ray and, and Don agree with this, is that you give the students the, the raw data rather than, than the, the finished product. You know, we could get data from Schlumberger or we can use the Imperial Barrel Award uh, data sets or something like that and have people work through them. But it's better to give them the unvarnished data and make them work through it with very primitive means because then our feeling is that they come to understand what the more elegant treatments of it are doing to the data. And uh, so I, don't, I, I think the, the imperative of taking small Kansas oil fields, which is what we've done for years, and, and analyzing them using the, you know, the rag logs and the poor production data and everything else is good exercise for the people, for the students. But then maybe we should have design two, and that's, that's um, unconventional. And, and I'm sure that you can, I know we could get um, information on particular uh, unconventional plays. Some of our alumni are heavily involved in them, and I imagine you have the same sort of thing. And, and then have the students analyze those in the geological and engineering sense, sure. Uh, but I think it ought to be a different, a different class rather than the, the primary design class because it's important to get people to deal with raw, unvarnished, incomplete data and think about what they've learned in their classes to try to understand that data. I don't know, Razor, you might want to comment on that. And uh, this actually makes us capable of working on more unconventional reservoirs. And in fact, we are looking for a reservoir with seismic data. It could be conventional or unconventional. Uh, the only concern and constraint here is the timing. We only have four months. And uh, we are typically looking for a small to medium sized reservoirs. But um, I don't think we, I don't know if uh, you guys have worked on, on conventionals before, but I think we are willing to work on that if, if there is an available reservoir that is mid-size or a small size, and uh, uh, we can finish it in, within the four-month period of time. But I don't know if I answered David's question. I'll definitely talk to him about that later. <laughs> Let's stick around for the last presentation this afternoon, because Ray's is going to talk about one of the projects that we did the project that was done this year and some other related information um, so you get an idea of the kind of stuff that we do with that class. Any more questions for Tony? Okay, we got one more. Okay. Yes, uh, I got a question. Can you go back to that uh, slide with the Chester and Valley Field? Um, it, it was uh, where you showed three separate fields within the valley. Four, four, I think, yeah. There it is. That's it. You had four of them. Um, in that picture, uh, where the four fields are, is that where you most likely the highest concentration of those sands were at? And then in the rest of that uh, valley, was it mostly shale? Um, well, I can show this picture right here. This is the, for the Pleasant Prairie field, and there's a fault right there that cuts it off. And so you go down into the water leg immediately mm -hmm. to the south of the field. The rest of them, I'm not sure. We're going to, uh, uh, this, this uh, valley train has been the subject of a substantial study that Marty Dubois is working on and, and um, John Yule and um, um, Lynn Watney is kind of overseeing it. And then um, 
I think Dennis Hedke's involved in that and some other people involved in it, as well as Peter and myself and uh, I don't know who else. Um, and, and we'll probably do some kind of an analysis of that, that trend as a whole. The, the um, Wide Awake and Shuck in South Eubanks fields have been studied by various people. I forget, one of them was done by Ernie Morrison and, and, uh, and uh, Montgomery. Montgomery and Morrison was done several years ago. Um, I forget which one. I think it was South Eubank that was done there. Those southern ones tend to be more tidal uh, rather than fluvial sands. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they, the sand has a different character. They're not as productive as this one is. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a different, different uh, kettle of fish down there. Okay. So I, I can't answer the question. I don't know what's in between. Okay, thank you.